welcome back, everyone. Um, very happy to have Hank back. Uh, already from his first talk, it's very clear how much time and effort he put into uh, his talk. So I'm very much looking forward to the second part. Um, Hank, take it away when you're ready. All right. Thank you very much, Seth. And like I said, thank you very much, everyone, for letting me come back again to give you another hour of what I spend my days thinking about. Um, to, to sort of set the stage for you, if last week, or if not last week, but if Monday was mostly about talking about sort of hardware and the way quantum computers exist, all of today is going to be sort of the nitty gritty of if I want to do high energy physics, if I want to do quantum simulations of the true theories that I sort of care about, what are all of the obstacles that sort of high energy theorists and sort of only high energy theorists can solve and sort out for us that need to be developed to make this a, you know, a prospect in the future? And having said that, I would be, of course, remiss if I didn't thank all of the people that have been involved in this sort of program that I've been working on for a while now. And, you know, what's what's sort of fun about this this new field of having quantum computers for doing quantum simulation is that in some sense, it's so new and underdeveloped for high energy physics that the barrier to entry in terms of what you need to know going into it is much, much lower than sort of, you know, our traditional high energy physics topics where in order to meaningfully contribute to a research project within a year that turns into a publication, you almost certainly need to already be like a graduate student who has taken quantum field theory coursework and taken super symmetric, you know, coursework and have a broad swath of knowledge underneath you. Whereas, you know, several of the people on this list are listed as students. Some of them have graduated or will soon graduate. And I would point out that both Sid and Hirsch are in fact an undergraduate and a high school student that were involved in this entire program. So this, field is really wide open if you're talking about trying to find out how to do high energy physics on a quantum computer. And so it's been a nice place to introduce young people and sort of, you know, build a culture and a scientific research program that doesn't exist out of, you know, long established traditions in the past. So with that out of the way, I will again give you the most important warning, which is that the current state of the art with the actual machines we have in front of us is, is very, very low. We have a small number of qubits that we can manipulate for a very short amount of time and do very few operations on it. And realistically, anything we wanted to do, as I hopefully convinced you on Monday, sort of almost anything we want to do that really sits in this high energy physics perspective is, you know, at least a few years off, if not, you know, decades off, depending on where you're going to draw the line in terms of interesting physics for high energy physicists. So again, just to set the stage again, what we need to do as high energy physicists is sort of formulate the problems we want to solve in real time dynamics in such a way that they're amenable to using a quantum computer for them. And this isn't, you know, as easy as you might imagine, as I'm hopefully going to convince you today, but it's not like it's going to be completely out of left field, the sorts of things you need to think about. So again, as, as we talked about on Monday, there are a bunch of problems that all sort of correspond to doing the dynamics of some interacting system that's a, a quantum field theoretic system. And we want to find out the time evolution of it after it's been perturbed by some system or perturbed by some outside interaction or just defining it in terms of itself as a dynamical process. And those are all, you know, sort of weasel words. But what I'm really trying to say, and hopefully immediately it's obvious to you that the way to calculate all of these things is by formulating them as some endpoint correlator that's being integrated over, you know, either the action, you know, the way we would normally do it in quantum field theory, or as, you know, the endpoint operator being inserted between, you know, an initial wave function and a final wave function state. So the real thing is finding ways to write the, the problems we would like to solve in terms of these endpoint correlators. That's sort of the step one you would imagine needing to do. And most of the time, you know, this isn't that difficult, right? For the, the neutrino nucleon scattering, for example, the, the initial state is going to be, you know, you have a nucleus and all of a sudden, sudden you hit it with an electroweak operator that is given a Q squared coming in of the, nutri of the, you know, the W or the Z, depending on how you want to pass the neutrino with it. And then you calculate its response to that uh, current insertion later in time. And, you know, that, you know, naively, if you knew how to set up the nucleon itself, this sort of just sounds like a perturbative quantum field theory problem. And therefore, we would use all of our standard perturbative techniques. But when either the initial state or the final state is some strongly interacting thing where you don't know how to define its wave function easily, or you need to have the strong dynamics in the middle. So in fact, for example, again, with neutrino nucleon scattering, if you're imagining the nucleon being excited because you send in a very, very energetic neutrino, you can imagine producing all sorts of excited states, 
or you can you know, imagine kicking the new nucleon up into some very high resonance that it then decays back from. So all of these things start becoming a much more complicated problem where you either need high, high orders in perturbation theory, or you need a really strong non-perturbative control. And so what I would sort of argue is that, you know, for us, the things that the quantum computer help us with is the same way that classical computers help us in quantum field theory, which is trying to solve the non-perturbative uh, regimes of these sort of calculations. And with that come a lot of caveats that one has to worry about that aren't always appreciated when you do perturbative field theory, which is that when you want non-perturbative results, questions of truncation and questions of regularization and renormalization become a, quite a bit more uh, complicated. And you have to be a lot more careful in how you can make approximations that are safe as you try and make this calculation. And that's all sort of, you know, again, weasel wordy ways of saying that the difference between a quantum field theory and quantum mechanics is that it's all about the infinities that come into this thing and then how you're going to regulate them and renormalize them away. And so if in your head, what you're imagining from the previous slide is, I would like to compute some non-perturbative operator in a fully renormalized way from a particular quantum field theory. Well, the way that we actually do that in practice with lattice field theory, which is going to be, you know, the way I'm going to propose we do things with quantum computers, is you have to make a bunch of truncations. You have to make a bunch of regularizations and then have to remove them later. And, you know, sort of the obvious one, which maybe seems the most innocuous, is, you know, naively, these need to be computed in infinite space time. And that's clearly impractical for a, co uh, a computer, classical or otherwise, just because that would require, you know, in, naively, an infinite amount of, you know, memory to store it. So, you know, the, the simplest thing we do is we truncate space time to be a space time that's, you know, fit within the finite volume. And then the difference between whatever operator you compute in that finite volume and the real operator in the true, you know, infinite volume theory is going to differ by some, you know, functionally dependent amount based on how small the volume you've chosen to compute is. Now, there are still a bunch of infinities hiding around that you need to deal with. And so sort of the next one that we, you know, usually do on the lattice is we're also going to actually impose a lattice on the theory. So instead of just being in a finite box, we're going to now take that finite box and break it up into lattice sites and links between them. And again, you've now taken this ostensibly continuum field theory operator that is the true value that comes out of QCD, for example, and you've moved yourself one further step away from it by truncating another thing. And so there's now some new function you need to deal with and then extrapolate away later. And the last one that we're going to talk about a lot today is the idea that when you're, you know, truly memory limited, this becomes a big limitation. But even on, you know, large scale quantum computers, you can't actually you know, represent an infinite local Hilbert space. So if you're thinking about bosonic degrees of freedom, you know, naively there's some field amplitude that goes with them that is any, you know, sort of complex valued number between negative infinity and infinity if you define it in, you know, a slightly silly way. But it's in an infinite, you know, system locally at every site and every link. And that itself is also a problem because you have finite memory. So what we actually do in practice um, on qu classical computers is, you know, for QCD is, you know, the canonical example. What we do is we represent each gauge link of QCD, which should be, you know, the gluonic degrees of freedom as a three by three matrix given by nine complex numbers that each of them is, you know, double, quadruple, or octuple precision. And so you can imagine that as long as that machine precision of each of those complex numbers is sufficiently, you know, large, you're not going to notice the fact that this isn't really capable of representing the full SU3 manifold. So, that is by virtue of us having a lot of memory today, where a lot of memory is, you know, the ability to do many, many, many complex numbers at, you know, quadruple precision. On the quantum computer, you can imagine, especially if we're talking about only having 53 qubits available, you're not going to be able to represent even one sort of double precision complex number, much less an entire lattice of them. So we have to make choices, you know, both in the near term and in the relatively, you know, longer term as we think about this, how we're going to truncate the local Hilbert space of our quantum field theory in order to render this thing something we can compute on the quantum computer. And in that truncation, just like the other two, you're now moving yourself again away from the continuum limit and have to find a way to remove that regularization later. So what are, you know, what I'm calling like sort of the champagne problems that need to be solved, where these are the problems that sort of the theoretical physicists and only sort of the theoretical physicists can kind of think about and need to work on. And, you know, they're, of course, all very tightly connected and the choices you make in one can affect the choices that have to be made in other ones. 
So it's not that you can do them completely, you know, independently, but there is some sort of, you know, circular, you know, improvement one can make where you improve one of them and then realize how it affects all the other ones and then come back, et cetera, et cetera. And again, as, as I'm sort of trying to motivate here, uh, all of these problems for the most part are just going to ignore the fact that the quantum computers we have today and for the foreseeable future are going to be very, very noisy. Because, you know, sort of while in the back of our heads, all we need to remember is noise means large limitations on, you know, how deep we can really go and how many qubits we can really expect to have. But it shouldn't sort of innately affect how you try and properly formulate a quantum field theory to do the calculations with. So, I mean, having said that, there are lots of people that work on that very direct edge of what people are doing in quantum computing and quantum simulations of high energy physics and how noise interfects with that. But there are lots and lots of problems that don't need that problem to be you know, thought about at this exact moment. And you know, if we're thinking about large scale quantum computing, that's a problem that eventually will go away. And so formulating something that will work right now may not be you know, useful far in the future. So what are the problems that you know, one really should be thinking about, if, at least you know, in my opinion, if you're a theorist? So the first one was the one we just talked about, which is like bosonic degrees of freedom are inherently an infinite dimensional Hilbert space. And you need a way to represent those degrees of freedom with a finite number of qubits or qubits. And what I'm gonna talk about today is sort of my you know, pet project about how to do it, which is to use discrete subgroups to approximate these otherwise continuous groups that we want. And so once you've chosen how you're going to digitize, how you're going to represent a single degree of freedom, there's the question of how do you represent the wave functions you want? How do I represent a proton or two colliding protons in terms of fundamental quark and gluon fields laid out on a space-time lattice? Because if I don't know how to prepare the states that I want, I can't do any interesting physics with those states. Um, uh, again, because I have a, a terrible lattice field theory background, I'm going to try and convince you that it's at least not crazy to think about using actual classical stochastic sampling methods to try and sample from these states and get the physics we might want. Then, if, once you've jumped over that very high hurdle of knowing how to prepare strongly coupled states, there's a question of, well, how do I actually take the time evolution operator? How do I take the Hamiltonian that's supposed to represent my quantum field theory and represent that in terms of the fundamental gates or in terms of some fundamental structures that I can give to my software or hardware friends that do quantum computers and build something that actually becomes a simulation later? And the last thing is, you know, how can observables actually be computed? There's sort of a couple of subtle points to how you do observables. One of them is, if you're thinking about everything in the Hamiltonian formulation, then you can't use sort of our normal action-based operators that we think about. You, you, know, you don't have access to, you know, endpoint necessarily time-related operators, whereas you have to deal with things like spatial uh, amplitudes and the momentum conjugates that go with them. So, you know, there's this subtle rewriting of a lot of our understanding of lattice field theory into a Hamiltonian formulation that allow us to write these operators in such a way that we actually would have access to them on the quantum computer. So this is, you know, of course, a, a broad set of problems. We're going to dwell especially on the first one because it's, you know, the one that's sort of most critical to getting all of the other ones, because the other ones can sort of be talked about in a model independent way. But really how you digitize a, a bosonic degree of freedom has a lot of consequences for the other ones. And it's also the least well understood of these sort of problems. Um, so before I go much further in this, I wanna put it like a sort of a huge disclaimer that the problems I just told you about and the solutions and how I'm going to suggest solutions can be merited um, are heavily influenced by my own personal aesthetics about what I think are important and what I think are not. And if you talk to you know 10 people doing this kind of research, they will give you 10 different you know, answers for what are the right things you should be emphasizing, what the wrong things to emphasize in terms of how you actually solve these problems. There's just so much unknown about how these devices will look like in the future, what hardware we will have, what software will exist on top of them, what efficiencies we can expect for different gates. There are lots of questions that without having those answers, you can't make you know, an, anything close to an objective measurement of which are the best ways and which are the worst ways. So there's a lot of judgment calls being made right now based on just intuition and personal preference. And so I'm at least gonna try and give you my motivating philosophy as to why this is the ones that I think are worthy of researching. So the first one is, is really that if it's not broken, you should not try and fix it. Lattice field theory has been wildly effective for us in the past. And a lot of formulations that use quantum computers 
sort of completely reinvent the wheel in terms of how they're going to do calculations and what they're going to think about as their fundamental degrees of freedom and how they're going to do this digitization. And that seems like a lot of work to me that you know may turn out to be the right way to do it when it's all said and done, but it also may just be going down you know a back end of reinventing things when it would work perfectly well to just stay on the lattice path as closely as possible and only changing the things that you absolutely have to because there's a lot of intuition about how the renormalization of non-perturbative field theories that we understand from the lattice perspective that you can map on if you stay within that sort of lattice formulation. But the big thing one has to do, and as I'm gonna have to discuss a bit is, well, if I'm talking about things in lattice field theory language, we would naturally say that it's an action. And so there is this change you have to make where you're talking about lattice Hamiltonians, but trying to stay as close to that as possible is sort of what I think is a reasonable set of principles to do this sort of research with. The other one is that you know premature optimization is the root of absolutely all evil, both in programming and I think in terms of research. There is a, a real concern that I have coming from sort of you know low dimensional field theories on the lattice background that there are many, many algorithms, there are many, many optimizations and many, many smart things you can do in one plus one, especially because gauge fields are non-dynamic on one plus one, that it's hard to expect them to really generalize to the full dynamics of a large dimension quantum field theory. And so there's, there's a lot of formulations and a lot of things that one can imagine doing in quantum computing that will allow you to really quickly do ostensibly interesting physics in one plus one dimensions, but none of those algorithms and none of those things that you're studying will ever be useful to getting to what is ultimately my target, which is QCD. And sort of QCD is not my only target. I would like to do the other parts of high energy physics and the other parts of you know, interesting things. But this is sort of you know, the guiding direction one should be thinking about, at least to me, is can I make this someday applicable to doing QCD in three, in three plus one dimensions specifically with fermions? If I don't imagine that this algorithm has a, any sensible extension, if I don't imagine this formulation will naturally go on to QCD in three plus one, then it seems like a very premature optimization to me. And so I'm, I'm heavily prejudiced by basically, let's reinvent lattice field theory. Seth has a raised hand either for himself or for someone else. Well, let me give you a, a hard time just to, uh, uh, I mean, it, um, historically on the analytic side, uh, I, well, I'm not a historian, but uh, uh, from the literature, it seems that lower dimensional models of, well, in particular of, of QCD have been incredibly important in, in our analytic understanding of QCD. Um, do you think, is there, is there really something qualitatively different such that I should think the same strategy just won't be useful in lattice field, as, as a lattice field theory strategy? Or, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sympathetic to, to your general uh, uh, statement here. I'm just wondering if, if there's like a, a really technical statement there or if that's more of a feeling. Um, it, 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 it's subtly related to what you just said, which is in low dimensions, we've found a lot of success doing analytic calculations. Like the, the, the necessity for having non-perturbative calculations actually from the lattice in low dimensions is, is, a, is a much, much smaller subset because a lot of things in one plus one can really be done analytically. And, and again, because in one plus one, there are lots and lots of symmetries that are protecting you typically. And I mean, one of them is that, you know, gauge fields are non-dynamical. There are lots of field theories that are conformal. There are lots of field theories that are, you know, what people call super renormalizable. There are lots of cute things that exist in one plus one that make your, that in my experience will make your numerical algorithm look like it's really, really great. Sure. And the second those sort of hidden assumptions that you had helping you in one plus one go away, it completely blows up the utility of your algorithm or your methods. And that, you know, is not quite as true in all analytic procedures, but like there are some where you're just like, well, I, I know this analytics will never go to high dimensions, but it's for subtle and complicated reasons. But this one is really just that. Okay. Right. And, Interesting. And, and again, that, that is not an uncontroversial statement. And that is certainly one of my prejudices that other people in this community will, will push back against the utility of like how those optimizations in one plus one are or are not useful. Gotcha. Thank okay. you. Yeah. So again, to, to go more into this, like lattice field theory, I would suggest has been successful wildly beyond what we imagined back in the 70s and 80s when it was sort of being talked about. 
So, you know, the way lattice field theory works is you, you know, you start out with your real continuum limit action and you discretize it by placing quark fields, you know, on sites. And then between them, you introduce gauge links. So you're not actually dealing with the gauge fields themselves, but these links that sort of correspond to, you know, a finite Wilson line that's connecting two quark fields. And then you build up, you know, from these links and uh, sites, some, you know, finite action that in the continuum limit, as you try and take this lattice spacing that goes with this lattice to zero, you will recover the true continuum lattice field theory, or the, the true continuum field theory. And we should pause here and, and really look at this equation because it will come up many, many times in various iterations over the talk. So if it's not immediately recognizable to you, what we're saying is that this SW, which is the so-called Wilson action, is, is given by the sum over all sites of some coupling constant times the real part of the trace of one minus the plaquette, where the plaquette is the ordered set of four links that goes around that site. And then you add to that some fermionic action. And for the reasons that, you know, fermionic degrees of freedom are supposed to be finite to begin with, we're kind of going to ignore the problem of putting fermions into our theory for the entire talk, because what we're really worried about is that these bosonic degrees of freedom are infinite. So when you do this, you also would like to wick rotate. And then you're going to be in Euclidean space. And then you have, as we discussed last time, this positive definite probability distribution that you can sample from with a Monte Carlo. And so what you do is you have a big space-time lattice where you're allowed to have fluctuations of each site and each link to be whatever you know, is preferred. And you accept or reject it, or you use some hybrid Monte Carlo procedure to sample from the full distribution of the path integral in Euclidean space. And then you insert operators wherever you want. And those operator insertions correspond to you having, again, formulated the problem you want to say, if I insert this operator here and this operator here, and I measure the expectation value of that two-point correlator, I will get something that corresponds to physics that I care about. And I can extract from that correlator then the result. And if you're working in Euclidean space, lattice field theory can compute you know, most of these endpoint correlators for you. Now, as you add more and more n to this endpoint correlator, it requires higher and higher statistics because they become noisier and noisier and noisier. Some operators are cleaner than others because some of them you know, have excited state contamination or lower state contamination that cause them to be statistically noisy. If you start trying to ask about finite density field theory, you actually introduce a subtle sign problem of its own. So lattice field theory you know, in Euclidean space struggles with that a little bit as well. But you know, a large swath of things can be computed. You can learn what the proton mass is. You can learn about glue balls. You can learn about you know low Q squared scattering. You can potentially learn about you know the parts of the tomography of the hadrons. You can learn about decay constants of mesons. Lots of things are actually accessible to you, but you know not everything. And again, the big part is when you really ask about the you know real time dynamics. And Again, I, I think that this procedure has been so successful that it's worth remembering how we got there. And it's very instructive by looking at how we got there to think about how we can go forward in the future. So, you know, there was a huge cliff sort of sitting in front of Ken Wilson in 1974 when he said, you know, I'm going to formulate non perturbative field theories by putting them onto a lattice. And, you know, at that point, Wilson was optimistic that this would be a useful analytic tool that you could use it as a strong coupling expansion to actually just get analytic results for QCD. And there was a huge amount of you know, work done in the 70s and the 80s, and maybe sort of petering out into the 90s, studying the analytics of strongly coupled field theories in the strongly coupled limit and trying to do increasingly high strong coupling expansions to get interesting results. And you know, a lot of that was very instructive, both for convincing ourselves that the lattice calculations we were doing were correct, and also for building the intuition that we needed. Now. People in the 80s, when they finally sort of started to get computers that were halfway, you know, of reasonable scale to do calculations, started to become interested in saying, well, given that you've told me that this is a strongly coupled field theory, that's, you know, a lot of our results we only understand in the strongly coupled regime, it wasn't clear that this lattice construction would actually take you to the continuum limit. It was ambiguous whether this theory actually had the right continuum limit to give you true QCD. And so a lot of effort was spent into studying how the continuum limit of these theories worked and whether it could rigorously be understood how that all you know, shook out. And you know, in the 90s, you know, people started talking about, well, it seemed clear to us that we could get to the continuum limit if we had large enough computational resources. But these were sort of observed to be prohibitively large. Like we were talking, you know, 
even with the computers we have today, we wouldn't be able to do anything of note in lattice field theory because the lattice artifacts that came from discretizing were so bad. And what they eventually realized though, is that if you start using more complicated actions than just the Wilson one that have smaller discretization effects, and you started using smarter operators that had better overlaps with the states you cared about, you could dramatically reduce you know, the effect of being at a finite lattice at a given spacing, and therefore could take continuum limits much more quickly. And this by orders of magnitude shrunk the amount of computational resources that you really needed to do the calculations that you wanted. You know, in the early 2000s is when we started first really talking about putting dynamical fermions even into these problems. So up until that point, it was either doing sort of pure glue calculations saying that QCD is, you know, mostly dominated by its gluonic fields and not really the fermions uh, bring a lot to bear into it. But finally putting in dynamical fermions that were light even was you know, an entire endeavor of its own where new algorithms had to be developed to make it efficient. You keep jumping forward and now you know, we're in almost the modern era where today people talk about doing you know, the form factors of heavy mesons and light mesons in the proton and using those to compute you know, scattering cross sections or observing things at the LHC or observing things at you know, B factories. And the other thing was we were starting to get to the precision where the lattice calculations were so precise on their own that if you did not include the QED corrections to QCD that come in at higher loops, you would be getting things that were discrepant from experiment. So imagine you know, you're now that many scales higher in your non perturbative calculation. And thinking about a long range force like QED being introduced, introduced a whole host of its own problems, but also was necessary to make the precision that we have. And then you know, sort of in this decade, the things we talk about are even more elaborate. We're talking about you know, parton distribution functions potentially being extractable by doing a highly convoluted set of boosts and then perturbative renormalization across you know, the light cone. And we're talking about not just doing you know, hadronic physics, but doing nuclear physics, where we can put nuclei onto the lattice and start computing their properties. So there's been this entire long you know, trek of 50-ish you know, years getting from you know, Ken Wilson just telling us that you know, lattice field theory was a thing that one could try and formulate quantum field theories in terms of to making the precision calculations that we do today. And it was by no extent clear at the beginning that that was possible. And it was by no extent clear that it was going to be easy or hard. And it was surprising to a lot of people that are, you know, remember back to the 80s when people talked about lattice field theory, that we've had the success that we've had now. And having said all of that, I'm now going to point out that essentially the one paper that most people that are talking about doing quantum simulations of quantum field theories with, we, the one Hamiltonian that we all use, and basically the paper that was written to define that Hamiltonian came out a month after Ken Wilson wrote down the Wilson action. So that is hopefully some perspective on potentially how many improvements are missing from our current understanding of how quantum simulations can go to you know, be at the place where we would be happy in four years. So again, I'm gonna talk a lot about lattice actions. So given that I told you that the natural way to formulate something on a quantum computer is a Hamiltonian, I would be you know, remiss if I didn't at least explain how that's a roughly reasonable thing to do. So, you know, there's the obvious statement at the beginning, which is the path integral is supposed to be related to the Hamiltonian of the system. So formally, these things should be connected. And it's a little bit deeper that one can talk about it for the Wilson action in particular. So if I think about the anisotropic Wilson action, where I've really written it here, where I've dropped a bunch of ones that aren't actually important to sampling with, and I've introduced this psi, and this thing is going to be the ratio of the spatial to the temporal lattice spacing. So you should imagine having a space-time lattice where you've, for whatever reason, chosen different coupling constants in the time direction versus the spatial directions. And the consequence of that is that the spatial lattice spacing versus the temporal lattice spacing will be two different scales. So whereas in the naive Wilson action, there's sort of only one UV scale defined by the lattice spacing, I'm just breaking this into two. And I'm going to say, I'm going to make the temporal lattice spacing larger or smaller than the spatial one in order to get you know, control over different systematics or something. But that's what's meant by the anisotropic Wilson action. Now, if you take this action and you start trying to plug it into a transfer matrix, what you can do is actually derive a Hamiltonian that should correspond to this lattice theory. And the actual action or the actual Hamiltonian that that will correspond to in the Hamiltonian limit where you then take this anisotropic lattice and you make the time lattice spacing go to zero. So you're doing continuous time and lattice uh, space, you will get what's called the kogut suskin Hamiltonian. And you know, the first term is hopefully vaguely 
reasonably looking to you, where it's just E squared, which is the electric field squared for you know a gauge theory that seems natural that should be E squared. And this other term, which is the trace of the plaquette, is secretly a B squared term for you know if you're talking about U1, if you're talking about QCD, you add your color components and you should be happy. But what this Hamiltonian looks like is an E squared plus a B squared. Now, in order to get this derivation from the Wilson action, you have to take a saddle point approximation because otherwise you will end up with an, an extra set of terms in the kinetic operator that gives you this E squared. So you, you've sort of, while formally there is a direct connection between the Wilson action and some Hamiltonian, you make a subtle breaking of that connection by making this approximation. So there's not a exact one-to-one -one mapping between the couplings of the Wilson action to the couplings of the Kogut suskin Hamiltonian, but they are you know, spiritually related at least. It's also important to note that the Kogut suskin Hamiltonian isn't the Hamiltonian of the quantum field theory. It's a particular choice we've made that has a certain amount of lattice error attached to it. This is some particular you know, choice of a Hamiltonian that has some regulators imposed upon it and some approximations imposed upon it, but one that we believe in the continuum limit will recover the true Hamiltonian. And it's again, important to emphasize that it's that these Hamiltonians in the same way that lattice actions are not unique. You can choose whichever discretation you want as long as it goes to the right continuum limit. So you know, it, it sort of should feel right to you that I can talk about things interchangeably between actions and Hamiltonians, and that I should be able to, if I formulate my theory correctly, and if I you know, formulate it in terms of a lattice field theory, there would be a natural way to map immediately across between those two things. Whereas if, for example, you started with some completely uncorrelated Hamiltonian with some strange degrees, fundamental degrees of freedom that you're going to tell me correspond eventually to quarks and gluons, it may not be immediately obvious how it connects to an action or how it connects to a lattice action that I already know how to deal with and know the approximations of. So that's sort of what's nice about the Kogut Suskin Hamiltonian is that you at least know it's connected to a lattice action that we have spent a lot of time playing with. So that's all a long winded setup to say, how is it that even if I take that Hamiltonian, I'm going to digitize a gluon? So as I said, there are, there are many, many ways one can choose to do it. And in preparation for snow mass, I tried to get a group of people together who are interested in working on digitizations that are all of us, I believe, working on completely different sections of uh, digitization and different choices of how to do it to sort of at least come together and put a rough set of references together that other people could look into and be aware of. And you know, the conclusion you come to is that there are lots of choices on how to digitize. And they all end up being some combination of you know, what Hamiltonian are you going to use? What basis states are you going to choose? for your computational basis? And then how do you truncate that basis when it inevitably must be infinite in some way, shape, or form? And those three choices, and in particular, the truncation one, have actual implications for you know, physics that you do. And you know, after you've made those, you can then start quibbling with each other about you know, which ones are the good ones. And I'm going to, again, focus on discrete subgroups. So you know, what qualities would make a good scheme for digitizing you know, bosonic degrees of freedom, and in particular, gauge bosons. So, you know, the obvious one should be, you know, you would like the quantum resources to be as few as possible. So, and it's not just necessarily that the local degrees of freedom take as few qubits as possible, but really what you want to say is, in order to get calculations that I can take to the continuum limit and the physical point of the, excuse me, of the theory, what are the fewest quantum resources I need to do that? So, you know, uh, a particular digitization scheme that costs a lot of qubits perhaps to locally represent, you know, gauge degrees of freedom efficiently, it might cost a lot up front just to do a single site, but the number of sites you need could be dramatically less than some, you know, more tightly constrained truncation locally. And so it becomes a question of balancing those two and actually figuring out how quickly do I get to the real limits that I want. You know, related to that point, but not always, you know, um, um, but sometimes unique and unrelated, or sometimes having separate consequences are, you know, when you do these choices of a Hamiltonian, a basis, and a truncation, what symmetries of the actual continuous field theory that you started with are you going to break? Because those breakings then correspond to, you know, lots of complications for you after the fact, and in fact, sometimes will drive you completely away from the continuum limit that you want. And then the last one, which is, again, my personal prejudice is, if this scheme can somehow be still simulated classically, then you can learn a lot more about it before the quantum computers come about. And so if you're capable, as I am in this discrete subgroup formulation, 
of mapping the Hamiltonian for the quantum computer to an action for a classical computer, then you can do lots of standard lattice field theory calculations to understand the, the, the structure of this theory and what approximations and truncations you're making and their effects without having to wait for a quantum computer large enough to do the same calculation. And I, I, again, I would be prejudiced to say this, but there are some of these discretization schemes and digitization schemes that cannot be simulated classically. So the only thing that they can rely upon is perturbative calculation arguments and essentially waiting for a large enough scale quantum computer to prove them correct in terms of getting to the continuum limit. And that seems like a lot of a waiting game that we can avoid if we don't choose those paths. So, you know, what do I mean by, you know, an example of how this digitization process might go back, go about? So, you know, a lot of people sort of start with the Kogut Suskin Hamiltonian, which is, as we said, is not the true continuum limit, but it is some lattice regularized version. What you then do is you say, well, what basis am I going to write my computational states in terms of? And if you look at this, there's sort of two natural looking bases already. You could, you know, write everything in terms of either the first term or the second term. You could write things in, a, in an electric field basis. You could write them in a plaquette basis. And, you know, those sort of seem like obvious choices potentially, but, you know, both of those will still be infinite. If you're talking about, you know, links, so these U's, then you need to be able to represent the full three by three matrix or some construction of it. If you're talking about the electric field, you know, the electric field, again, is also, you know, allowed to go infinitely large in whatever directions you want. So you, you would still have an infinite degree of set of degrees of freedom unless you truncate. But in both of those bases, it's sort of easy to see what you do. You just sort of say, if you're in the electric field basis, for example, I'm only going to allow some certain maximum amount of electric field. And in that case, you know, I then say I'm going to take a, a maximum amount and I'll choose some resolution with which I can measure these states. And then I can construct a finite Hilbert space. But once you've made that truncation, you're no longer using the original Kogut Suskin Hamiltonian that has those continuous degrees of freedom. And the way you should think about it is you're now using some, you know, further regularized Hamiltonian that has some additional operators that are pulling you away from the continuum limit. And, you know, depending on how you choose to truncate, these operators are going to break potentially new symmetries that were preserved by the previous Kogut Suskin Hamiltonian. They could break unitarity if you choose really interesting bases. Um, the actual dimensionality of that operator depends greatly on what, again, basis you might choose and what truncation you choose to put on top of it. So this operator could be, you know, a high dimension operator such that it doesn't actually affect, you know, the IR physics as you take the continuum limit, or it could become a relevant operator that in fact drives you away from the actual continuum limit you wanted. And, you know, if you're you know, really careful and want to think about this very hard, the particular truncation you choose and the operators you introduce to cause symmetry breaking will then be affected by the noise of the computer. So if you were counting on the computer to protect you from some particular gauge symmetry or boost invariance, and you break that operator, the quantum computer's noise can mix into that operator even more complexly and cause even more problems for you. So once you make that truncation, you've changed the fundamental Hamiltonian you're actually computing with away further from the lattice regularized one. And you have to recover that at some point. Seth, do you have another question? Yes, uh, this is probably silly, but um, I would have thought that that since we're, when we go to the lattice, we're roughly imposing a, a UV cutoff and that would sort of already make us truncate, you know, the strength of electric fields and things. Is that, um, uh, should, should I not view those as conceptually linked? So you, you, you could, or you could not. So <laughs> what, what do I mean by that? Like it, in some sense, when you, when you do the lattice discretization, you're imposing an overall UV cutoff on everybody in some sense. And it would be, you know, silly of you to allow your local Hilbert space to be able to go to a higher electric field than what you know is sort of capped by everybody. So there, there is some obvious way in which, well, it's, let me, let me back up and not say it's obvious. If you work a little bit harder, there are ways in which you construct the truncation in electric field or, or link basis such that you stay sort of consistent with whatever overall cutoff you're imposing by the lattice itself. But, but that, that gets tricky very quickly because you most of the time don't know what UV scale you're actually working at on the lattice. That's something you typically have to compute after the fact. That's, that's the, this notion of scale setting where I, I put in some bare couplings and I find out what scale I'm working at. So it's, mm -hmm. it's not trivial to make this tight connection, but you, know, you can in some situations make that happen. 
actually. Thank you. Yeah. And, and, and that's in fact, one of these, you know, somewhat potentially premature optimizations one can do is you say, I'm going to find some way that I'm always going to link the local Hilbert space truncation to the, the overall one I imposed by the lattice. And that's, it's not necessarily quite such a dangerous one, because again, what we really do on the classical computer is we make it infinitely, uh, you know, arbitrarily dense such that we don't even have to worry about this problem because we can, but in, you know, the early days, they did try and link up those two discretizations together. And in fact, that's part of what I'm going to argue about later is you can get away with doing. Yeah. Now, just one more time with big, bold words. This is not trivial. This is probably one of the biggest problems we have right now in terms of how to put these things onto nearish term quantum computers is how do the truncations we choose change the actual calculations from the theory that we really care about, which is the continuum limit versus the lattice calculation we will get out. And you know, for, for people less familiar with the lattice language, these are you know, hopefully words that will inspire you. Your choice of the truncation is part of what's going to define for you the effective field theory you're working at in the IR. And you, know, you can ask questions both about, you know, is the effective field theory the right effective field theory and that it has the right degrees of freedom with the right couplings and things? And can I make that matching in the UV? And then there's the second question of, well, if I start trying to remove that cutoff, am I going to keep recovering the right continuum field theory or am I going to completely screw up? As I was, we were just discussing with Seth, you know, the cubic costs you have scale as a function of the lattice spacing. As you try and go, you know, raise your UV cutoff higher and higher and higher, you should expect that your truncation needs to be allowed to go higher and higher and higher as well. And if you don't, then you're, you know, clearly going to be screwing up the, you know, the physics that's going on here because all of a sudden you're allowing, you know, the energy scale of the global theory to, you know, go to, you know, 30 TeV. But if each local fluctuation is only ever allowed to go to one GeV at all, then you can never get, you know, something like a localized state of, you know, a Higgs field where you're supposed to have 125 GeV in one particle. If your cutoff scale for the local theory only allows you one GeV, you expect to be wildly deformed from that. So your cubic costs really scale as a function of the lattice spacing and secretly hiding in that running of how they, it's a function is whatever truncation you've chosen. And your bad choice of a truncation can screw up how it is as a function of AES. You know, as I've repeated many, many times, the continuum limit can change. So if you're imagining that, you know, if you had an infinite, you know, Hilbert space locally the way you should, you always will end up in the sort of the blue point, sort of no matter where you're sitting in your crazy lattice approximated action. If you're confident that all the operators that you've introduced that are lattice operators are higher dimensional, then as you go to the continuum limit, they will all disappear and you will run to the fixed point that you want. But if instead, you know, you either cannot remove those operators as you try and take a continuum limit, or in fact, they're relevant operators, you can be driven, you know, in some pocket of this coupling space to this red point. And you'll never be able, no matter how hard you try, as you try and drive towards what you think is the continuum limit, get to the continuum limit of the theory you really cared about. You'll find some other theory. Or you, know, you may not be able to take a continuum limit at all. That's also possible. But these choices are like both highly non-trivial and not just a, you know, a computational like crutch we're using, but they actually change the physics. And if you understand that physics properly, you, know, you can you know, imagine how much better you can do the calculations now by understanding them at a theory level. You know, when you start talking about the things we care about, like if you want to compute matrix elements, if you want to compute correlators, the renormalization you get is much more complicated on the lattice than it is in continuum field theory because you have fewer symmetries that protect you. And as you keep breaking more and more symmetries, the actual renormalization becomes harder and harder and harder to do properly. And you don't just have, you know, the few renormalization constants you're used to, but you can proliferate a huge chunk of them. And that's both a numerical headache to deal with, and as a theorist, it's a you know a, a you know conceptual headache to deal with. And you know, finally, sort of another somewhat subtle point is you know the operator that is causing the truncation, or the the lowest dimension operator that causes the truncation, is not necessarily just the operator you get by saying, oh, I'm going to just take my truncation and replace my continuous variables by this truncation, because what will happen when you're doing non-perturbative physics in a non-perturbative regime is that you break that symmetry and it will generate for you essentially every other operator that's allowed that breaks that symmetry. So even if you say this is you know, a dimension 40 operator, if that dimension 40 operator breaks gauge invariance and you're doing calculations at you know, relatively coarse lattices, it will generate for you a whole bunch of lower dimension operators that also you know, violate gauge invariance. So it's not enough to have high dimensionality 
if that operator breaks some crucial symmetry, because you'll expect lower dimension operators to then be generated as well. So I'm clearly running far behind schedule, but how do discrete groups actually work with all of this? So the, the picture for discrete groups naively is wherever you have a, a gauge group element or a gauge group you know, electric field variable, you just replace it by it's a, a discrete finite subgroup counterpart of it. So you figure out what group you care about like, uh, and what's important is that you're, we're going to argue that in the IR, provided you have some sufficient remnant of this gauge symmetry by having some discrete subgroup that's sufficiently large, you don't actually need the full closure of the whole group to get the right IR physics, that you'll get sufficiently good results for you know, reasonable lattice spacings, provided that you have some remnant of that gauge symmetry being preserved for you. So for SU3, uh, the example that I've been proposing is that this, this so-called Valentiner group, which is a 1080 element subgroup of SU3 that sort of uniformly, you know, crystal likely uh, covers the SU3 manifold. And if you do that, then you can replace these three by three matrices of complex numbers by just a set of 1080 integers, which you can then represent by many, many orders of magnitude, fewer links or fewer qubits per link. And, you know, I think this is a sensible thing to do, partly because this is what people did in the early days of Lattice when we didn't have a lot of memory and a lot of computational power. And also because I sort of believe that, you know, the realistic end game here is again, that we won't have to reinvent all of lattice field theory just to use quantum computers, but that our computational resources will grow with time in such a way that eventually we will be doing complex three by three matrices again on the quantum computers. And so you don't want to choose an algorithm that completely rewrites all of that formulation when you can just keep the old ones and accept that for, you know, some lead up amount of time, you will be, you know, slightly off. So uh, I have a question, like, yes, the other alternative, which might be a bit naive is to, instead of having a continuum, you impose some sort of cutoff, like for the matrices that you pick. And I guess that's bad. Like that's much worse than the V, v group. Is that the idea? Um, so, so what we really do in, in, again, what we do today in lattice field theory is we, again, do not have the full SU3 group. We, we have some notion of, you know, binary truncation of, you know, double or quadruple precision numbers. And in that way, you've, you've truncated the full set of SU3 matrices to some subset of that group. And there's nothing sort of inherently wrong with that idea, provided that group, that subset is dense enough as well. Because once, once the subset becomes dense enough, then your inability to have closure under the group is hard to notice in any realistic calculation when you deal with the statistics and the other systematic errors. But sort of at the, the level of you know, the Valentina group where I only need, you know, 11 qubits to represent a three, uh, a three by three matrix for SU3. It's not clear that at that sort of granular level, there is a better subset that you get, you know, better coverage of what you want without sacrificing, you know, the gauge invariance at that point. So it's, it's a trade-off you can imagine having and people, you know, in the, I think 85 or something talked about, you know, take this Valentina group and, in, and add to it every single midpoint between two group elements. And that was then going to give you a subset of the SU3 group. And they found that it did better, of course, but it costs you more you know, numerical resources. So it's not at all clear that that's a bad way to go. You know, as we progress, it's a question of you know, when does it you know, win out over other methods? Is that an answer? Yeah, thanks. Oh, okay. And is there some systematic way of thinking it has to be this specific subgroup or? Uh, so, I, I, I have but sort of the weakest weasel words to say this, but what you would imagine is that good subgroups are ones that sort of uniformly sample from the group you have underlying you, right? If you have, you know, U1, it's sort of obvious that there's only kind of one set of groups that makes sense, which is the ZN groups. So you just take the circle and you, you know, uniformly break it into sections. For SU2, you could imagine that there are, there are groups where it's basically a U1 cross Z2. And this group, you know, of, you know, so you, you might then say, take that U1 and break it down into a discrete group. So you have like Z4 cross Z2. And this one doesn't sort of uniformly cover, you know, SU2 space because it has these, you know, sort of, if you imagine on the sphere, you know, there are huge patches of it where it's not being represented very well. So there are, there are clearly groups where you, you know, the best thing you want is something that sort of uniformly covers the group space. And then you want it to be uniformly covered as densely as possible to get the best approximation. And groups that 
are not sort of uniform in that sense where you can imagine their sort of preferred axes or whatever are not going to work out nearly as well. And that's the sense in which this Valentiner group is the best one. It's the, it's the largest finite discrete crystal-like subgroup of SU3 that you can construct. Thanks. Yeah. So, you know, with all of that, it's important to say that, you know, discrete groups can't reach the continuum limit. They just, by construction, sort of can't generically. Because what they really are is if you started with the continuous group and couple it to a Higgs field in some particular representation, and you then take that Higgs coupling and drive it to infinity, you're actually going to then reproduce, you know, the discrete group. And this is sort of, you know, canonically understood really well for the U1 and the Zn cases. But what you find is, you know, if I do Z2, and I understand that the continuum limit of U1 is actually beta goes to infinity and kappa goes to zero. So this bottom right corner, you see that it's in a Coulomb phase. And at no point along the top axis where the Z2 group sits, are you ever in that Coulomb phase that's attached to the continuum limit. So in some sense, you're never actually able to compute Z2 in a good as a good approximation of U1. But as you keep adding more and more degrees of freedom to your discrete group, you, you go from you know, Z2 to Z infinity, you expect that you ought to be able to do U1 reasonably well. And so what happens is that after you pass Z4, once you hit Z5 and keep going larger, there opens up a small sliver of space where all of a sudden this Coulomb phase that you know is connected to the continuum limit of U1 also exists in the Z6 phase, or in the Z6 group. And so in that little blue regime, you can start computing things that look a lot like U1 correlators. Now, you can't take those U1 correlators and take the lattice spacing to zero, but if you impose this UV cutoff of some specific lattice spacing, you're getting results that look consistent with U1, even though you're only working in Z6. And you know, if you want to understand this at a formal level, what you would just do is take this you know, action that I've written here and start integrating out in our effective field theory language those Higgs degrees of freedom. And what you'll see is that you know, in the Higgs breaking phase and at this high coupling phase, you're driven to be only in the elements of the U1 group that represent the Zn group. So the picture you should have is that discrete groups are really supposed to be you know, continuous groups plus a Higgs field. And provided that Higgs field is introducing you know, a high enough scaled operator, you know, the representation that that operator goes into and what dimensionality it gives you is determining what breaking of the continuous group to the discrete group you get. In the same way that by choosing different Higgs you know, representations in you know, BSM physics, we can break you know, SU5 symmetry down in particular trajectories in the way that we would like to different continuous groups. It's the same sort of picture. And again, the higher the representation that you're putting the Higgs into, or the larger the, the discrete group of by effect, the larger this cutoff scale where you get this breaking happens is, and therefore the smaller and smaller the lattice spacing you're going to be capable of going to, and the closer to the continuum limit you can get before you see the big effects of it. And you know, if this really annoys you and you dislike this, what you should remember is that when we do lattice field theory, we never actually recover the full continuum, you know, space-time symmetries. If you ever try and probe states that are at the, close to the UV scale, you'll always see that those states can tell that you're living on a lattice and not in the continuum. But in the IR, we're perfectly happy because those states can't really resolve the fact that they're on a discrete lattice. And as you can imagine, if we're talking about, you know, the representations of a finite or of a continuous group that maps onto a discrete group and how those need to be coupled to a particular Higgs field, this is all gets complicated relatively quickly for non-abelian groups. And there's ongoing work to understand, you know, how these particular representations of the Higgs need to be put together to make this breaking happen. Um, I will sort of skip over this, other than just to say that, you know, the Wilson action we learned was sort of inadequate for a lot of reasons, because its continuum limit is very, very slow. And the solution is you just add those higher order operators that are causing it to be slow. You add those to your actual lattice action and you tune their coupling such that you approach the continuum limit faster. And so there's every expectation in my heart that if we're really going to do quantum field theories on quantum computers, we're not going to use the Kogut Susskind Hamiltonian all that often in the early days. We're going to try and use something where we get to the continuum limit much, much faster. And that just requires developing you know, an improved Hamiltonian because they reduce the errors and they reduce the powers of the errors and they may therefore make things cheaper. Um, and doing the same thing where you modify the action actually will change which subgroups work as good truncations and which ones don't at a particular cutoff scale. Um, you can make this, you know, systematic by trying to construct some Wilsonian, you know, renormalization with slightly different degrees of freedom than just a Higgs field. And we did that showing that, you know, you can get improvement for SU3 itself. 
Um, and we've even done lattice calculations where we sort of showed that if you use one of these modified actions for a discrete group of uh, the Valentiner group, that you can reach lattice spacings of something like 0.07 Fermi. So we're doing things where the cutoff scale is at you know, 2 GeV or so, which is well above a lot of what we would be worried about for sort of the very early stages of quantum computing QCD, which is again itself a huge task to ask about. And there's ongoing work to understand, you know, what does the Quinn spectroscopy look like in this group? Is that thing more sensitive to this, you know, scalar Higgs field that's secretly hiding somewhere in our calculations? So, you know, with the very limited time I have left, you know, what is a proton in terms of partons is a very, very hard question to ask. You need to essentially know what the wave function of the proton is in terms of quark and gluon fields if you want to compute anything on the quantum computer in terms of the quark and gluon fields. So you could imagine using some clever algorithm that adiabatically drives you towards the proton's wave function. Or, you know, what I would suggest is that, you know, no matter what you do, preparing these states is going to be very, very expensive. And if you can offload as much of that as possible to a classical computer and then just pass in simple things to the quantum computer, you'd be better off. And so really what we propose is you just you do a standard open boundary condition lattice QCD calculation, and then you use the quantum computer as an operator inserted onto it where you just say, given this lattice configuration in Euclidean space, I'm going to then pass into it the ability with a quantum computer to do a short real-time path integral that I then can compute against, and then just sampling from the two. And you know, there have been very preliminary results showing how this D4 subgroup and how Zn or Z2 group can be used to do both thermal physics and scattering physics in these two groups. And you know, if you talk about these small little discrete groups, there's, you know, reasonable expectations that in the next five-ish years, we can see something on both Rigetti and Google hardware that does these things. Um, I'm really going to skip over this, unfortunately, and actually talk about quantum computing. So I promised you on Monday that, you know, if you don't want to think about, you know, uh, c knots and h Hadamards and phase gates and things like that, you can sort of think about things at a bit more of an abstracted level and say, well, what do we need to actually construct the unitary operators that correspond to the kinetic and the potential operators in our Hamiltonians? And if you think about it in this lattice field theory and group link language, then it's really obvious that what you need are the group, uh, the, the group operations. So you need to be able to take a gate that gives you a group element and invert it. You need to be able to take two gates or two links that have gauge elements in them and do a multiplication upon them. You need to be able to take a trace because we need to be able to actually compute the, you know, the Hamiltonian terms in it. And then you'll need a Fourier transform to actually go into you know, the conjugate momentum basis. But if you have those four gates defined for your particular discrete group or your continuous group, in fact, you have everything you need to then draw what the kinetic and the potential terms look like. So these are sort of the low level primitives that any lattice field theory needs. But once you've you know, built those as one part of your project, you can then start constructing whatever Hamiltonians, whatever potentials you want out of them. And these are all you need. And so there's lots of small steps going with D in groups, where, as we discussed, you know, the connectivity is, is crucial to getting these right. If you have high, high connectivity, the actual number of gates you need is much, much lower. And in fact, scales linearly as opposed to quadratically. And you know, we've implemented the very, very simple multiplication gate on this Rigetti hardware. And you know, as of sort of today, we're capable of doing multiplication of two gauge links for D4 with about 30% fidelity, which tells us that if we wanted to do the potential energy operator for one time step, we're already sitting at you know, 10 to the minus three. So this is not something that could be fully fledged built into a Hamiltonian time evolution quite yet. And I will just skip all of this and just say that at the end of the day, there is lots and lots of things to do. And many of them can be done and need to be done before the machines exist because they will be crucial to driving down the actual computational resources that we would need in the future. And with that, I will, like I said, end and take some questions. Thanks so much, Heck. That's That was incredibly useful uh, and interesting. Um, any quick questions? Just a short one. I mean, uh, um, in the best possible world, just a, a, a very naive one. Okay, in the best possible world, suppose all, all, all everybody's optimization and so on all worked out you know, imperfectly, and and multiply by ten. Okay, so 
and uh, and and how how many qubits you need to to you know in the end uh, how many clean qubit let's say you 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 need in the end to to do something that is uh, let let let's say uh, uh, hydronic vacuum polarization of uh, operator calculation. Um, let me get out my computer really quick and I will give you some rough guess. So I, I would say, you know, a, a, a 20 cube lattice. So again, we're only, if you're working the Hamiltonian, you, yeah, if you're working the Hamiltonian, yeah. 8,000, okay. No, 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 no. That, 8, so that, 000, so, the lattice sites, yeah. Yeah, 8,000 lattice sites. And, you know, my claim is that with this Valentiner group, you need something like, 11-ish qubits per gauge link, and you need three of those. And then you need to add on something like, I think, 12-ish qubits to do the fermions. So, you know, we're talking about something in the range of, you know, hundreds of thousands to a million qubits that are, and, and these are logical qubits. Yeah, clean qubit. That, yeah. That and and, and at, that, at that point, you're talking about doing things that we were doing, like the analogous things that we were doing sort of in the, you know, the late 90s, early 2000s. In, in in lattice. Okay. So that's not going to come anytime soon. I I I would expect that will be close to the end of my lifetime. Un, again, I, I mean, unless I mean people were lucky back in the 70s and 80s when they got to be asked these questions because they weren't recorded for their seminars asking them what they thought. And they were all wildly overly pessimistic too. So I, I could be proven completely wrong and this could come much quicker, but you know, as we, as we discussed last time, that's, you know, a hundred thousand to a million logical qubits. You, you know, can take something between a factor of 10 and a factor of a thousand in terms of how many physical qubits you need on top, like take that number multiplied by those numbers to get the number of logical one, or physical ones we would need. And you're talking about something huge. And mm. while these companies are promising us millions of physical qubits by the end of the decade or by within a decade of now, I'm not entirely sure if those are rosy predictions or not. I had another quick question if possible. Sure. Um, what about not instead of uh, simulating field theories, simulating something like a matrix quantum mechanics, which are much, much simpler. Um, these theories are usually not local, but uh, I don't know how relevant that is. Or could, that, could that be computationally much less expensive? Yeah, and in fact, there, there are people who talk about them as being another, like, like regardless of their, their computational cost, they're interesting in their own rights to do, and there are people that talk about them exactly with quantum computers. There are, there are also people talking about Orbifold lattices, if that means anything to you or anyone else, but they're they're like if once you get interested in like you know string theory or supersymmetric gauge theories or you know quantum gravity, there are other formulations where sort of off the bat they can't be done classically. So they're sort of like whereas lattice QCD and you know traditional gauge theories, the bar is somewhat high into what we need a quantum computer to be due to that's interesting. Lots of these other things like even low dimensionally have terrible, terrible sign problems or can't be formulated straightforwardly on classical computers. And I know that some of these matrix model particular problems are of that class of like, they have a sign problem that makes them a horrendous nightmare to deal with classically. So I, I expect that people in that field could probably, you know, use much fewer resources than I need to do something non-trivial and exciting. But that's the extent to which I have an understanding of those matrix models is that they, they naively have sign problems and they are very difficult to deal with classically. So they're, they're probably lots of interesting things there. Great, thanks. Well, great. Uh, let me stop the recording.